He preaches. Uh, so then we're in Acts chapter 17. I, on, your, on your screen it has verses 16 through 34. I'm not going to read all of those, but go back at home and you can read those. I'm actually going to start in 22 and read 22 through 31, okay? I've kind of already told you the story. That's kind of the, 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 the story in a nutshell of all those scripture there. He's in Athens waiting on Silas, Timothy, and he's going to share, he's going to preach to those who have idols in Athens, okay? And so that's just a, but we're going to look at his sermon. So I'm going to ask you to rise to your feet. We're in Acts 17. We're going to begin in verse 22 and go through verse 21. In verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, this is in Athens, okay? And said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, it is him that I'm about to declare unto you. Notice that. It's him that I declare unto you. Verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath, and all things. And has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And certain also of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offsprings of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to Repent, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he has raised him from the dead. I just shared with you Paul's sermon. What a what a sermon is! I want to kind of break it down and let's look at what Paul shared to a bunch of people who believed in a bunch of different gods and didn't know any of them. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, uh, this time that we could come. Tonight, dear Heavenly Father, we look at Paul's sermon in Athens and, and God just what he preached and how he preached and how receptive it was. And, and God, that, that we can glean from it some, some truths that in our own lives that we could do the, uh, we, could, we could share in the same manner, the same way. The words that Paul had, dear Heavenly Father, the message that he had is a message that the world today still stands in need of. So God, just help us to see that. God, just speak to our hearts and our minds and what we share tonight to give us the thought process and the heart, dear Heavenly Father, to go and to share in a world, dear Heavenly Father, that needs to hear about Jesus. Well, uh, just, just be with us tonight, dear Heavenly Father. Watch over care for us for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If I could just set the setting there, Athens was a booming place. Athens was a, 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 a rich place. It was, a matter of fact, it was known as a place of arts. It was a, a learning center, uh, libraries with a, a lot of books, and again, there was a lot of people that were philosophers of the day. Now, again, Paul has uh, uh, had his troubles in two different places uh, prior to this. In Thessalonica, as he has preached, and been run out of town in Thessalonica, right? When Paul preaches revival or riot, and so he's been run out under the cover of darkness. He left Thessalonica. And again, a lot of people would say that Paul was a failure at that, but he wasn't. God just uh, used him in a different way, in a different place. He gets to Berea, right? And when he's in Berea, he preaches. And what did he do in Thessalonica? He went in the synagogue and he 
teaching, taught, and he argued, and he, and he shared with those at Thessalonica. And then he, he leaves under the cover of darkness. He gets to Berea. He goes into the synagogue of Berea. Uh, and, and again, they were more receptive. But those people from Thessalonica travel the uh, 50 to 90 miles, whatever it was, to come down there and harass and get the people stirred up. And so he leaves again on a boat and he gets to Athens. Now, again, he's preaching the gospel everywhere he goes. He's sharing with all these different people and all like that. When he gets to, he gets to Athens here, and, uh, and, and the, the, the sense is, is that Paul would prefer to kind of wait. I, I just kind of see Paul like, I finally got out of those places. Man, I'm just going to, I'm going to hang out a little while. I'm, just, I'm going to stay here. They've chased me out of town and I've had all this I've had to deal with. And kind of just a little R&R, &R, a rest and relaxation. And he ends up in Athens in this artsy place. And this uh, place of knowledge and thinking, and uh, and so uh, uh, I'm just going to lay low for a little while. And so that's really the setting. That's really where we are in this thing. And and so Paul had arrived in Athens there. And, uh, and, and matter of fact, uh, uh, it has been said that it was easier to find a, a God in Athens. It was easier to find a God in Athens than it was a man in Athens because they had so many different kinds of gods. Matter of fact, Paul notices that. He gets into, into this artsy town. And by the way, them being artsy, they would be able to create, create these out. Man, look at the works of the hands uh, of these artsy people. And so they would go out and just make an idol of another god. And so they have all these you know, Greek mythology gods and all these kinds of Greek gods that they have. And they created all of this. And in order just to, to play it safe, they have created an idol to the unknown god. And really, this is the thinking for those that was an athlete. Again, they're thinkers, they're philosophers. And, and, and listen, they want to hear everything new. I want you to understand, those people at Athens, they want the next newest thing. They want the next newest thought. They, they, they want they, their hunger for, for, for new, something new, you know, and, and, and thinking and all. And, and so in order to appease the gods, they just build this altar. And in case we miss one. In case we didn't call him out by name, you know, in case we didn't call this God by name, they just literally created one to the unknown. It's the one that we don't know, the one that we left out. And so again, now, uh, Paul has, has arrived here in Athens, and, uh, and, and this is what he found. And so as he's sitting there in Athens, and, and I'm sure Paul had went out into the streets and looking around, at least he's gotten on a boat and he got far enough away that maybe somebody's not going to chase him down from Thessalonica. And so I'm sure Paul feels a little safer here at this place. And so uh, as he's sitting there and he's looking, he's looking around. Now, you and I, I want you to hear this because there's something that begins to stir in Paul. Paul's wanting to rest and Paul's waiting on Timothy and he's waiting on Silas. And, uh, you know, he sent for them. But he's sitting there and he begins to look around in the city and he begins to see all these idols that are there. He begins to see how they're worshiping all these gods. And that one idol that they have built to this unknown God catches his, catches his attention. And so uh, as, as, he's, as he's scouring this, he's provoked by the idolatry. So here's what happens then. Paul then begins to preach because as Paul, remember, Paul doesn't preach because that's what he does. Paul preaches because that's who he is. He's been called in spirit of God has called him. Jesus had called him to preach. And so there's something that begins to stir in him. Now, let me tell you what most people do right here. Most of us, we want to suppress that. Most of us, when God gets to doing that stirring in us, it carries us to that unfamiliar place. I, I don't want to talk to that unfamiliar person. You know, and I've always said, uh, shared this, that, that fear is the number one thing that causes us not to be what God wants us to be. When fear happens, and I've used the example in, 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 you know, in Peter's life, when, when Jesus Christ is crucified, y'all remember, Jesus is crucified, and, and Peter has been bold in his faith, and he's been bold in what he says, but yet Peter denies Jesus Christ. And he's up in that upper room, and, and, and so Jesus has been crucified, and all these guys that have followed Jesus, and, and they're terrified because if they'll do this to Jesus Christ, surely they'll haunt us down. Uh, that uh, inner twin. I want you to. We, we, we give them a, a, a bum rap sometimes. We give a Thomas and all them that, that, you know, we call him Doubting Thomas. But, I, but, but put yourself in their shoes. I mean, for three years they followed Jesus. Jesus has had the answer. He's bailed them out. Okay, I'm going somewhere with this. And so uh, they, they've watched Jesus. They've seen the miracles. And now Jesus is gone. They want, he's been crucified. 
I mean, there's been angry mobs. It ain't been just one. <laughs> See, it ain't just Herod that wanted him dead. There's angry mobs. They have called out people like Peter and said, you're one of them too. That's why Peter, fearful of his life, said, I don't know the guy. Now, he was broken at that. Now, I want you, I want you to imagine... When they were in that upper room, what that must have been like after Jesus has been crucified and they're gathered together and their leader's been killed. And they're sitting there and I'm sure they are worried and they're wringing their hands. What are we going to do? Are they going to come knock on the door and drag us out? Are we the next ones that's going to be crucified? You know, and I can, I can just imagine the tension and I can imagine the defeat that was in them. That's why they had a hard time believing that Jesus Christ was, was raised because they were so defeated in what had happened. And if you remember, Peter in that upper room, this is what he said. He said, I know what I'm going to do, guys. I'm going to go fishing. Because that's all Peter knew. That's what he knew. He was a fisherman before Jesus came. And he just wants to go back to the old way. He just wants to go back to the things that's familiar with him. Because fear will do exactly that. Fear will lead you back to what's familiar. See? Uh, that 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 uh, uh, that sea that that red sea that is out there sometimes that God's got to divide for us for us to get to the promised land is a scary proposition that we got to go across that place and so for Peter and all them they were terrified okay now Paul is a little different than that for you see Paul is not one that would fear his or that Paul has fear that he goes back to the land of familiar Paul is very focused. Because he handled his fear on the road to Damascus. Paul is no longer fearful. Matter of fact, Paul in his life continually to, he continues to pray for boldness. And, and listen, it's not anything new for Paul to be threatened, his life to be threatened. And, and so, I mean, what can you do to Paul? You can only thing you can do to Paul is kill him. There have been people trying to do that. He's already been half dead before. If, you, if it's possible to be half dead, he's been beaten to the point where they thought that he was dead. And so he doesn't have the fear like Peter has. He doesn't have the fear of the apostles. He's, he's laser focused. Now watch this. There's something that begins to stir in him. Now I said that to say this. When it happens in our life, when God begins to stir us, it gets us to the place where we get a little shaky and weak need. What do we do? We Most of the time we're Peter. We go back to the land of familiar. We don't take a step in faith to go and be what God or, or do what God wants us to do. All right? But not Paul. Notice this. As he's sitting there, and, uh, look at verse, if, if you will, just go back and look at verse 16. I know we didn't read this, but I want you to see in verse 16. Now when Paul waited for them, talking about Paul and Silas, waited for them in Athens, his spirit... All right, he's trying to get rest and relaxation. He's waiting on, hey, he ain't going to do anything. He's waiting on Timothy and Silas to get there. All right, because he left them behind. Look at this. His spirit was stirred in him. His spirit was stirred in him. God's getting a hold of him, right? Why was his stir, uh, spirit stirred in him? When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. He's like, man, look at these folks. You, you me tell you what Paul said. Paul's looking around and saying, you know what, these, these folks need Jesus. These folks need God. I mean, it's almost like not only is his spirit stirred in him, but his heart is broken for them. His heart is broken for them. Verse 17, look at this. Where does Paul always go? Now, he didn't, probably didn't have plans to go to synagogue, but once his spirit is stirred, see, Paul, Paul is willing to talk to anyone. It doesn't matter if it's in the marketplace. It doesn't matter whether you're Felix the governor. It doesn't matter whether you're Agrippa the king. It doesn't matter whether you're the emperor Caesar. Right? Paul is Paul was standing before all of those in shoes. Notice in verse 17. He wanted to rest. He wanted to find the relaxation. But because the spirit is stirred in verse 17. Therefore. Therefore. When he saw the idolatry worship. He could have went back in fear. He could have withdrew, but notice verse 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue. <laughs> he just went to the synagogue. He went right, he doing exactly what he done in the other places. Where they beat him in the other places. Where they run him out of town in the other places. Therefore he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons. And in the market, notice this, anybody that would listen to Paul in the marketplace. Hey, he was at Walmart sharing with them, right? In the marketplace. Anybody that would listen to Paul. 
He, 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 listen, the Spirit has moved him, uh, mark it daily with them that met with him. And look at this. And, and then there were certain philosophers. Now, it says there that he meets with the Epicureans that are there and the Stoics, all right? Now, let me give you a thing about the Epicureans and the Stoics. Again, we're in this philosophy here. The Epicureans were people who believed in the pleasures of life. You live your life however you want to. You take the pleasures of life. That's what life is all about. It, it, it is about your satisfaction. Sounds a lot like the world we live in today, right? It sounds a lot like the world we live in today. And so uh, the, 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 the Epicureans was, was just like that. If it feels good, do it. Matter of fact, they believed in gods and multiple gods, but, but this is their thought. God, gods have nothing to do with mankind. And so you are left to your own device, you're left to your own pleasures, and you just do what makes you feel good. Again, in the world that we live in, there'd be a lot of people that'd be epicurious, right? You just do what makes you feel good. You just do what you think is right. You just do what is right for you. No, you do what's right by God. But that's the epicureans. And so you've got these pleasure seekers, you've got these who believe that God has no interaction with mankind at all. It's kind of like, here's all these gods, and they just kind of doing their thing. And here's mankind, and mankind, you just do the best you can. You live your life, live it up, have a good time, because you're only going to be around for so long, and then you're going to be gone. That's the Epicurus. The Stoics were those who said, you have no emotions. No emotions. You are, listen, in order to be the best that you can, you have no emotions at all. You learn how to control everything. One side is all about pleasure. The other side is about depriving yourself of even emotions. That's the, the stoics that are there. And, and so here, here was their ideal. Their ideal is this way, that everything is God and God is in everything. That's the Stoics. And so God's plural. So, so gods are everywhere and everything around is all these gods. So you can understand now why you got the problem of idolatry and, and just those two groups. And the Bible says that, that Paul, moved by his spirit, begins to sit and he talks. And so as he begins to talk into synagogue, he gets the attraction of these people, these philosophers like Epicureans and Stoics who are trying to figure out life and do life and live life and God and all these and gods and all these things, they, they begin to, he, he begins to get their attention. At least I, I will have to say this is that, and that when Paul talks, people seem to listen. <laughs> Again, that's the power of the Spirit moving in Paul, right? Now, here's the thing, that is, Paul begins to speak, and you can go back and check this. I'm just going to give you the uh, abbreviated version, uh, version of this. Uh, as, as he begins to speak, here's what they actually say about Paul. As, as those thinkers hear Paul, they say, you know what? He's, just, he's here to tell us about another foreign God. <laughs> it's just a foreign God. And so they, they, that, that, that's these, <laughs> these philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics, they, they begin to listen, and they say, well, he's just a proclaimer of some foreign God. And the reason why is this, is because, and by the way, this is really the ones where Paul really gets in trouble, because Paul begins to preach about Jesus Christ. He literally goes, he says, this idol here is this unknown idol. Let me tell you who he is. Okay, and he uses that to bring about Jesus Christ. And he uses the word, y'all remember this in our Wednesday night Bible study, he uses the word resurrection. Oh, my goodness. They didn't believe in resurrections. Uh, the, these philosophers believed that there was only life and, and then you die and, and it's over with. And so uh, they, they literally bring him to Areopagus a, a and uh, Mars Hills there and, uh, on the side of the mountain. And they, they, they want him to speak and they begin to listen. And he's doing, he's doing that. He's, he's talking and all of this. And, 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 and they're listening to him. He's about 370 feet above the valley there on the mountainside. And, he, and he's sharing there uh, above the marketplace there. And, and, he, and he's talking and, and, and all these people are listening. And then he uses that word resurrection. Blows everything up. But let's get to the sermon now. I want you to hear the sermon that he shares. And, and, and listen, there may be people out there that you and I, 
If, I don't know, maybe we could write this down. Maybe we could share this with them. Maybe this is a great outline. You got, an, you got my outline tonight. Maybe this is a great outline that you could write, that you have here, that's really Paul's outline of his sermon. I want you to hear the sermon that he shares. I want you to understand that these, these philosophers are sitting there, uh, marketplace people have come and gather, where, whoever would come and listen that is there. He's attracted a, a, a crowd and, especially these Epicureans and, and Stoics and all these guys that are sitting there. And, and, and so Paul is ready to preach to this crowd. And here's his sermon. So my, we got the setting now. Let's look at the sermon. Here we go. The theme is this. I want to share with you, this is Paul. I want to share with you the God that you don't know. I want to share with you, that's, uh, uh, I guess I, I titled my sermon to, tonight, but Paul's title and the theme of his is the God that they didn't know. Matter of fact, acknowledging that there was some devotion that they had. They had devotions to God, uh, but he makes mention. Uh, it's almost like I, I can see Paul doing this. It's, it's like, you know, I see your devotions and how your artsy hands have created all of these things. And I'm sure they've painted things and drawn things, but they've created out of gold and, and stone all of these idols to all these different gods. And, you know, you and I would walk around. I don't know. People in the world would walk around and say, man, look at, the, look at the good artwork that this individual has done or these people have done on this one. And, man, look at the detail on this one. And, and, and look how this one captures a, a, you know, a, 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 a look. A, a look how this one glistens in the sun. And, and so you can go all over the city and see all of that. But Paul said, but, but when I was walking through, there was one there that had this name on it and it said to the unknown God. Let me, let me share with you, let me share with you about this unknown God. Verse 21, for all the uh, uh, Athenians and all the strangers which were there spent, uh, their, uh, which were there, spent their time and nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. They want to listen to Paul. They want to hear something new. Verse 22, watch this. And then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hills and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Here's his main point. For I've passed by and, and behold your devotions. I see how you're worshiping all these gods. You're devoted to all these gods. I found, while I was walking through town, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship. You're worshiping this idol and you don't even know who it is. Now, I want you to watch this. Now, he's not saying God is an idol, but he uses that to introduce. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship him I declare. In other words, not the idol, but the God that you don't know. I want you to see that. He's not saying, I want you to worship this idol. I want to introduce you to the God that you're talking about that is the unknown God you don't know. All right? Now, here's his, here's the first, here's his main point right here. Here's, listen, here, I want you to share this with people. I want you to understand tonight what Paul is sharing to you and I. I want to revisit what you believe in. And I want to show you what Paul believes. Because he's going to share with some people what he believes, what he knows, and here's his sermon points. You can write them down, all right? His main four, first one is God is the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. God created everything. How do I know? Look at verse 24, real quick. God, this, this, this unknown God I'm going to introduce to you, here he is right here. It is the God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of the heavens and the earth, and he don't dwell in the temples that's made by hand. He's not an idol. He's not a building. Uh, he, he literally says, this is the, I want to introduce you to God. Can I introduce you to my God or not? He's the creator of the universe. That's, that, that's Paul. Listen, the, the people out in the world today who are the philosophers and the scientists and those that are trying to figure it out, you and I know, listen, they can teach evolution. They can teach all the things they want to teach. But you and I know the fact, the reality is, is that our God is the God who created the universe. That's not a new thing. That is something that has been inspired. Listen, if we believe in the inspiration, who was it that moved Paul? It was the spirit that moved Paul. And it was the spirit that told Paul to preach this. And this is what Paul preached under the power of the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't come from Paul. What he just said is a validation that God says he's the creator of the universe. Does that make sense? So that's the first one. God is. So his main point is God is. All right. God is the creator of the universe. Second one. 
Second point of Paul's sermon is this. Is that God is the sustainer of life. Look at verse 25. Neither is he worshipped with man's hands. You can't build an idol and worship him that way. As though he needed anything. Like you can build something that's going to be better than God. Like God needs you to build an idol. That God needs you in your arts. No. No, it's not, it's not with man's hand, though he needed anything. See it, look at this. Here it is. Here's what Paul says. See, he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Not only is he the creator of the universe, but he is the one who sustains life. He, he created life, but listen to what I said. He sustains it. Okay? That's Paul's second point. I'm telling you, you want to share with people in, in the world that we live in? Here you go. Here's what you can share. All right, you can use Paul's sermon right here. Third thing God is. All these are God is. Third thing is God is. Look at, look at verse 26 and 27. God is the ruler of all nations. His power is one that, that makes him what? King above all kings, right? Uh, they want to hear something new. They want to hear a new thought. Look at verse 26 and verse 27. And has made of one blood all nations of men. <clears throat> made of one blood all nations of men. Uh, he's over all the nations. For to dwell on all the face of the earth. He's the one that made the nations to dwell on the face of the earth. And has determined the times before appointed. In other words, he, he says when they are nations and when they're not. All right? And the bounds of their habitation. The borders of their, it is God who sets the borders. All right? And watch this. That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And so he's the ruler of the nation. God is. His next point, God is the father of mankind. Verse 28, 29. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, there was poets that had written about God. Right? And then how we were his children. And he just verified this is the God. For we are his offspring. Verse 29. For, for as much then as we are the offsprings of God. We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold. The gold can't be your father. That idol can't be your father. Or silver or stone. Graven by art and man's devices. No. He is actually the father of all mankind. Not some idol that is licensed, not some idol. We're going to get somewhere with all this. God is. The next point, his fifth point, God is the judge. Here's where really the rubber begins to meet the road. God is judge of the world. Watch what he says in verse 30 and 31. And the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now has commanded all men everywhere. And by the way, if you don't preach this, you hadn't really preached to repent. Yeah. To repent. Paul preached repentance. Because he had, verse 31, he has appointed a day in which he will, not, not maybe, he will judge the world in righteousness. You know what I told you? We will all stand, right? Everybody's going to stand before a righteous God. He is right. He is right. In other words, nobody's going to go to heaven who doesn't deserve it. Nobody's going to go to hell who doesn't deserve it. It, it will be right. So Paul shares that. That he's the judge of the world. Now let's look at the response of this because I, what it was the world needs to hear this. The world needs to hear what Paul is saying because we got so many idols today. We've got so many people who believe in all kind of other gods other than the main God, the right God, the real God. And so the response of this, uh, verse 32, and when they heard of the resurrection of dead, he preaches about Jesus Christ, he preaches about the resurrection of dead. Look at this. The resurrection is so mocked. Ha <laughs> ha! That's what the world does today. Y'all understand about two, or three, uh, two, three weeks ago when I, I preached on uh, uh, the, the Antichrist, I had someone come in that I was paranoid. <laughs> because I preached on the Antichrist. That's what... And I don't know who the dude was. He just, he, you know, he's one of those little keyboard dudes. And he said, you just paranoid. And I thought, you just wait. <laughs> and my, my thought was, no, listen, you don't even, he don't even know me. Didn't know me. And he's going to tell me I'm paranoid. You know who's paranoid? The guy who's telling me I'm paranoid because he's afraid I'm right. 
I mean, why would you, why would you send somebody a message like you don't even know or not even worried about it because he's worried about it? You know? And I'm sure I preached this, this morning. It's out on the Facebook. If somebody have a comment say on that, I just laugh and say, just wait. Just wait. But that, that's the world we live in. That's the response that you're going to get. And we, we find it here. Uh, listen, they, uh, they just uh, laugh and they mocked and, uh, this bodily resurrection is foolishness. But now it goes on and say in verse 32, uh, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but listen, but others said, hey man, we'd like to hear a little bit more about this. We'd like to, we'd like to hear a little bit more about what Paul's got to say. And so, it goes on and look at verse 33. So, uh, so, so Paul departed from among them. How be it certain men clave unto him and believed. There's some that even believe. They believe what Paul's preaching. They are in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now I want to get to the closing of this sermon. The observation. Let's, let's look at some objects. Let's, let's just kind of, in my mind, let's look at some things. Let's, let's look at regarding the sermon. Okay? Can I, can I give you some information tonight? Hey, folks, I know you're Christian. And I know you got power, you got the power of the Holy Spirit, but you got to learn to be tactful. You got to learn to be tactful because you can do so much damage to the testimony, not only to yourself, but the testimony of the church if you're not tactful. Paul was very tactful. Paul didn't go in there snorting and, and, and pitching a fit and kicking up dust, okay? Matter of fact, most of the time Paul doesn't do that. Paul doesn't preach that way. He just lays it out there, and there are people who have a reaction. And the fact of the matter is, Jesus is going to cause a reaction. When you preach Jesus Christ, he's going to cause a reaction. Some of that's going to be good, and some of it's going to cause other people to snort and kick up dust. All right? But I want you to notice that Paul used tact. He was very tactful in what he done. He didn't go in there and start tearing down idols. He didn't go in there and start kicking up dust. He didn't go in there and start calling them all names and telling them they're going to go to hell. Look at verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. That's all he said. You're, a little bit, you're, you're, you're too superstitious. Now wait, what did I say? Look at verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotion, he even said, I see that you're devoted. He didn't attack them. He said, you're a little super, you're, you're superstitious. I see that. And you're devoted to these gods and you're devoted to the artwork and the arts of your hands. And he was very tactful in what he did. He acknowledged that they, listen, they were spiritual. How many times have you heard that? Well, you're a Christian. Well, I'm not a Christian, but I'm spiritual. Well, so is the devil. He's a spirit too. Our spirit, right? Just an evil spirit. And so, Paul used tact. The second thing is this. Paul began with the spiritual condition of his audience. You got to know where people are. You got you to meet people where they are. I want you to understand. Again, Paul looked at their spiritual condition of the audience that was there. They believed. They already had a belief system and supreme beings that were just multiple beings that they believed in. But they didn't know the true God. They had a belief system, okay? They, in other words, Paul understood that they, they had the capability of believing. It wasn't like they didn't believe in something. Uh, it, what does people say? Oh, I'm atheist. No, there's no such thing as atheist. You believe in something, right? And by the way, in order to be atheist, you would have to have all knowledge that there is no God, and that would make you a God yourself. I'll just throw that one out there for free, okay? And so, uh, Paul didn't go in there and say, okay, uh, th this is where you are. You know, he understands that they have this, this system. And, 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 and so, he begins to take that system that they have of belief and just begins to transform that. People believe in things. We just got to get them to believe in the right thing. You understand? So, Paul starts with a spiritual condition. Now, the third thing is this. Paul made use of an acceptable authority. Here's what Paul did. He went out there and he said, you know what? He said, by the way, you have points and things to talk about this God. And the God that he talks about is the, is the God of the, the created of the universe and all this, the God of the heavens. And there's poets and writers. And, and, and listen, I know you don't understand that. And, uh, but I want you to understand that I'm here to validate and I'm here to say that those guys who wrote about it, this is the God that they were talking about. And so he literally said, you, you know what the, great, you, the greatest tool that you and I have is the Bible. We have, or what, we, what we can do is we can go and say, look, I, I, I know what it said, but here's the people who have the eyewitness account. Here's the people who said they saw Jesus. 
His people who spent time with Jesus. Here is those that, even if they weren't eyewitness, just a few years removed from that, who Paul made this statement. And when Paul's life, after he's done, you know, he's, Jesus has been crucified, Paul said this one time. Paul said, Jesus Christ appeared to a lot of people. He said, there, there's hundreds that Jesus Christ appeared to. And this is what he said. He said, a lot of them are still alive today. He said, go ask them. That's what, that's what Paul said. Go, you, you, go, go ask the authorities. Go ask them. Hey, go ask Herod. You want to find out? Go ask Herod. I've always said this. If anybody could have proved that Jesus Christ wasn't who he said he would, it would have been Herod. Herod had everything to lose and everything to gain if he could have proved Jesus Christ wasn't who he, was, who he said he was. Herod was so afraid that he didn't want to put guards there, right? He was afraid. He even, he even said this. Let's make up this story that if Jesus Christ's body is raised from the dead, because in the back of his mind, he was afraid that that was going to be true. He said, we will make up the story that his disciples came and stole the body. That's how afraid he was. That he sets guards there. Because, so if anybody, anybody would have said that Jesus Christ wasn't real, it would have been Herod. I guarantee you on that third day of Jesus Christ had the raid, Herod would have been standing in the middle of the street saying, Jesus Christ didn't raise. I told y'all so. I guarantee you Herod would have had every person that was in his palace going out making sure and telling everybody how Jesus Christ was a failure. Guess what? He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. And that's what Paul says. Take the authorities. Take those that believe and you and I have the authority of the Bible. You want to take my word for it here. You got to share with somebody. Give them the, give them the sermon of Paul. So here, I want, you to, I want you to hear what Paul wrote under the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is what he says. And so, Paul used their authority. Fourth thing, Paul led his audience to the main theme of the gospel. Didn't take him long, did it? How many verses we read there? Only a few, ten verses in his, in his, in his uh, uh, sermon there. Don't take him long, get to Jesus. It don't take you long. Listen, he, he, you, you can talk about the weather if you want to. You can talk about uh, how good those idols look. You can talk about how shiny they are if they're built out of gold. No, Paul didn't do any of that. Paul said, let me tell you about the unknown God you don't know. This is the God you don't know, and it's not long. He's talking about Jesus and the resurrection. He done stirred up a bunch of philosophers who don't believe uh, in, in what Paul is saying there. And yet there are some that, that listen there, okay? And so Paul uh, led his audience to the main theme of the gospel. Fifth thing, real quick, is to get ready to close. Paul used the resurrection of Jesus Christ as ultimate proof. I told you before, there's a lot of people that was crucified. What was different in Jesus Christ? He was raised from the dead. That's what makes Jesus different. That's the eyewitness account. When you got people who stick their head in a tomb and he's no longer there, that's what made him different. That's what proved that he was who he said that he was. And so, Paul, again, just go and check it out. Go ask some folks. You'll find out the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's when all the problems here. This is, this is where it really starts for Paul. And that's why we end up finding that he has to go to Caesar and make an appeal to Caesar. Last thing, real quick. Here's the thing that happens to the response. The response. I want, you to be, I want you to be ready for these. Okay? Because people's going to respond when you share, when you talk, when you talk about church. How are you going to invite people to church? There's going to be one of three reactions. I want you to talk about Jesus. I want you to talk about the Bible. I, 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 want you to, I want you to do it. I want you to share with you. Listen, I want you to share with everybody to come and contact. Notice Paul went to the marketplace. He preached there. Paul went to the synagogue. He preached there. Paul built a trick when he preached there. Everybody come in contact with. Here, Paul, there, Paul, everywhere. Paul, Paul, all right? Who are you going to preach Jesus? One of three reactions always happen. Be ready for it. Okay? The first one is rejection. <coughs> rejection. Notice what the Bible said. Some of them mocked Paul. Let me ask y'all this. Y'all think that hurt Paul's feelings? <laughs> but it does ours sometimes. Don't it? When folks reject what we got to say, you think it hurt Paul's feelings? No. But, that, but, but just, just be ready. There's going to be people who reject you. And I'm not going to say that you do it right off, but there are times where you do exactly what Jesus did when they rejected him. He dusted your feet. Because they rejected Jesus Christ too in his own home thing. You're going to have rejection. 34 years of ministry, I had doors slammed in my face. You know? You know what I done? I knocked again. Mm -hmm. They didn't come to the door. But I know this. They knew I didn't give up. They knew I didn't just walk away and say, well, I was defeated. I knock again. I'll wait two or three minutes. 
I ain't coming to the, I had, that's what I had one lady say, I ain't coming back to the door. I just knocked again. Well, that's rude, huh? Rejection didn't bother me. You don't have rejection. Second thing you're going to have is reluctance. You're going to have reluctance sometimes. You know what some of them said to Paul? Hey, we want to hear you again on this. We're just not sure yet. We're not sure yet. We, we, we want to hear you again. Can, can we meet again? Can we talk again? Hey, isn't it great to go to, you may go to a house and share with somebody, you may share with your friend, they, some of them may reject you. But isn't it great when they say, hey, I want, I want to hear a little bit more about this. I ain't got time right now, but will you come back? You know what I say? One day, I'll pull my phone and get my college right there. One day, one time, one time you want me to come back. I want to come back and share some more with you. Because there's reluctance sometimes. We all reluctant a little bit, right? We all reluctant at times. Especially when we hear something strange, something new, something different. We gotta test it out. We gotta find out. Reluctance is okay. It's okay to be reluctant, right? It is, right? So there's rejected reluctance. Then the last thing is this. This is a good group. Reception. They, re they receive it. Bible says that there were those who mocked him. There's others said that we'll, we'll hear you again in the matter. Verse 32, 33. Let's read 32, 33, 34. We'll close. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Rejection. Others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Reluctance. And so Paul departed from, from among them. Verse 34, how be it certain men clave unto him though. When Paul left, guess what they done? They went walking with him, didn't they? They went walking with him. And notice this. And believed. And a matter of fact, we've got, we've got two that they give the name of them. Be focused. Be focused. Share the gospel. Share Jesus. Yeah, they're going to mock you. Some going to hear you again. But there's going to be some that believe. That's the power of Jesus. Simple sermon. Just a few verses. He says, let me introduce you to the God you don't know. Let me ask you this. Do you know anybody in your circle that don't know Jesus? That needs to know God? Is there anybody that you could go and just share this? Hey, I want to share with you. He's the creator of all things. He's the creator of the universe. He's the sustainer of life. He's the father of all mankind. He's the father of all mankind. He, he is the one over all things. He's the one that gives life and the sustainer of life and holds life in his hands. He's the ruler of all nations, the father of mankind. And you know what? He's the judge of the world. He's the judge of the world. Get you a sermon. Well, I ain't a preacher. That's all right. Get you a sermon. I'm not talking about standing in the pulpit, leading the church or anything. I'm telling you, go and share Jesus. Get you an outline and share with those who need to know the God they don't know. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we could come and that we could share tonight. God, I just pray that as we've heard and seen the example of Paul tonight,